thank you all very much uh, for joining us and, and thank you for the invite. Always wonderful to um, be uh, part of the, the Western Front Association seminars. It's also always slightly um, terrifying as well because um, you know uh, it, it's such a fabulously knowledgeable audience. So I, I always know um, that I'm, I'm sitting with, with experts here. So uh, they were mainly tonight going to be concentrating on the Royal Artillery War Memorial. And um, you know, at first I was thinking in this talk that what I might do is try and make a comparison with, with people like um, Eric Kennington, um, uh, Gilbert Ledwood, um, uh, Philip Lindsay Clark, but um, in fact, there's so much to, to be said about uh, Sergeant Jagger. I'll concentrate on him, you know, and we can pick up on some of these others um, in the uh, questions. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, apologies for um, uh, concentrating on just one sculpture, but I say uh, hopefully that there's more than enough to, to keep everybody interest, interested just by looking at Sergeant Jagger. So let's um, quickly work out who, who we're talking about. There he is, Charles Sergeant. Jagger, as you can see, he died a relatively uh, young man, um, uh, possibly, you know, exacerbated by his um, war wounds. Um, it was uh, uh, chest and, and, and lung complaints that um, helped finish him, uh, finish his life uh, early. There's his portrait by his brother David. David was an artist. And what I would say is take note of that scarf and the coat. It is going to become um, uh, important. We'll come back to that later on. Um, and let's just have a, a whistle stop tour through his life, shall we? His biography. As you can see, he's, um, a, he's a, a, a Yorkshireman um, from the Sheffield. He's, I suppose, what was it, right on the cusp of the lower middle class, very top end of the working class, because his father's a, a colliery manager. Um, interestingly, although Sergeant Jagger um, throughout his life, you know, made a point of, of using his Yorkshire mannerisms and an accent um, and, and was very proud of his um, uh, sort of lower class roots, particularly when he was moving in London, sort of higher artistic and literary circles. Um, despite that, he, it, you might say there was a perhaps a tiny element of pretension, you know, that he added his mother's maiden name in later life so that he became, he moved from being just um, Sergeant Jagger, sorry, Charles Jagger to Charles Sergeant Jagger. Um, because of his artistic skills that were noticed as, as a uh, young man, his father apprenticed him to Mappin and Webb, you know, in, in the great steel city there in, in Sheffield. And I think that training as a metal engraver, you know, we're going to see in his approach to detail in his war memorials. Um, very quickly, you know, his skills are noticed, so he becomes a, a teacher at the Sheffield Technical School, um, then wins the scholarship to the Royal College of Art, um, where he studies with the, the professor of sculpture, Edward Lanteri, and becomes his assistant you know, and, and um, wins the Prix de Rome, uh, just beating uh, Gilbert Ledwood actually to it, but um, can't take up the prize. Um, he, he does actually at the end of the war, he, he, um, the Royal College of Art reinstates it and he gets his chance to, to go to Rome. Um, but he joins the artist rifles then into the Worcesters and I think he's very proud of the Worcesters. Again, remember that because that's gonna be important a little bit later. He uh, served in Gallipoli, where he was um, rapidly wounded, um, you know, a long time uh, recuperating in Malta, later goes, uh, joins his battalion on the Western Front and wins uh, a military cross in, in April 1918. Um, and 1918 is an important year for him because he's also in that year commissioned to start uh, to produce some war memorials by the British War Memorials Committee, uh, which um, were earmarked for the Hall of Remembrance, you know, this great um, artistic scheme that was to include all of the war art, but never ended up being built. So, so the materials, most of the, the collection was given to the Imperial War Museum. So that's a very quick run through just to give you some sense. But you know, obviously this man is a veteran. He, he knows what he is talking about when it comes to depicting the war. And I think that, that's crucial his approach to memorialization. So let's jump in, Let, let's get going. And, and rather than go through sort of memorials one by one, I thought it'd be more interesting to try and pick out themes. So what do we see in his themes? Well, horizontality is 
absolutely crucial. You know, there are long horizons, um, horizontal lines um, in Jagger's memorials. Um, and that made me think, you know, uh, is it because is something that's on the horizon, you know, a long horizon line? Is this both the soldiers most prized view? You know, the, the thing that they never see because they're in the trenches. Um, and they, so they never see the proper landscape horizon. Um, but they do see lots of parapets. Um, and, you know, and again, something that always fascinates me um, about war memorials um, is how we can slot them in to the wider artistic reactions to the war. You know, even if their sentiments might not quite be the same, um, illusions and ideas. I think it's a, it's a great idea, you know, to see the paintings, the poetry, the literature, um, the memorials in, in as, as some kind of continuum, you know, what links them. But these horizontals it always reminds me, you'll see that a, a lot of um, what uh, Jagger um, works on reminds me of um, Owen uh, and, and also uh, David Jones in parenthesis. So, you know, we do get and builded parapets and trenches there. I mean, that, that, that parable of the old man and the young. So you can see very firm horizontals there in that, um, the Anglo-Belgian War Memorial in Brussels. Um, and obviously here as well, you know, um, the horizontal lines um, uh, going across the way your eye is dragged from horizontal to horizontal there in this world and it strikes me that there is a veteran you know there is a veteran who knows something about trench maps who knows about parapets about the ribbons of the trenches um, through the landscape he is emphasizing that these men lived um, you're know, contemplating the horizon through things like box periscopes every day, you know, and, so, and seeing them um, in uh, the parapets of trenches. And these deep incisions that he likes in stone, you can see um, uh, that, that um, just like Charles Holden, you know, this sense of massing, of building up big blocks of stone create the effect. And that um, the Royal Artillery Memorial, just looking at the incision of the sculpture, always makes me think uh, of Owen's strange meeting, you know, where, where he talks about going down the tunnel long since scooped through granites, which titanic wars had groined. And it's almost as if, you know, uh, Jagger does that with, with his um, instruments as a sculpture, he groins them um, into his granites, into his stone. And, you know, lest we think that this, um, you know, that, that worst thing that can ever be said, I know in Britain, you know, when anyone that is, is accused of getting too arty farty, you're just reading that in. Oh no, you should never read anything in, should you? But if we look at the original architectural model, um, for the Royal Artillery Memorial and Jagger's study of it, you, know, you can see he moved the gun round a further 90 degrees to put it on the 180. And I think that is to emphasise the lines. It doesn't work as well like that. So he obviously wanted to get that sense of the horizontal. And you can see um, between the early model, he works um, that the main architectural features were actually put together by Lionel Pearson, who is, of course, Charles Holden's architectural partner. They're, they're in a partnership um, together. But you can also see that he decides to um, drop the idea of bronze bas reliefs, just keep bronze for the sculptures and bring in stone. So he, he mixes stone and bronze. But we can come back to that in, in a moment. Um, at Hoylake and West Kirby, you know, where ostensibly it's an obelisk, but it strikes me that obelisk works. It's far more dramatic in its pull on the eye upwards because it arises out of the horizontal base, out of that plinth, out of that trench parapet, you know, um, and paradox that, and that drags the eye upwards along the length of um, the, the obelisk. So once again, I think that the trench eye view is crucial. He's bringing that um, to his understanding of what makes impact in a war memorial. And, and therefore, of course, is, is also a veteran in a war memorial speaking to other veterans 
here at Hoylake and West Kirby, you know, obviously it's going to be the civilian community that commission him. And as we know, you know, from a lot of the discussions and arguments about war memorials, that in the end, that they end up being built by the bereaved for the bereaved. Here, I think Jagger is showing that he's aware of, of another community. Now, clearly veterans are part of the bereaved, but they've also got a lot of other things, ideas of comradeship, ideas of the history of what they've been through going through their heads. And I think he gives an element of that here at um, Hoylake and, and West Kirby. And I say, it's something that you can see though, it generally in the, the architectural reactions um, to the war, and, and particularly in someone like Charles Holden. Um, and you know, never more obvious than at Passchendaele New British Cemetery, where the horizontals are everything, the, the dragging of the eye along that, which then emphasizes the, um, the height of the, the cross of sacrifice towering above it. And um, of course, just you know, as a little aside, Charles Holden almost giving you battlefield features there. It, it's almost built you pillboxes um, that, that you know, the instruments of death uh, then actually become the, um, the, uh, the, the shelter way, the, the leading into the land of um, uh, death. So um, some fascinating ideas there, but we can talk about Charles Holden on a separate occasion, if you like. But it's just to sort of point out that this is a theme that I think is running through veteran sculptors and, and, and architects, um, that they can't escape this. Um, what else is going on? Well, um, some deeply ancient influences. Well, um, Jagger was very interested in uh, Egyptian and African sculptor. And the thing that he took from uh, Egyptian sculpt was um, putting figures against walls, how that heightened then the vertical um, effect against the horizontal. Um, and, and that's going to be um, absolutely crucial to the effect, particularly of the figures on the Royal Artillery Memorial. Um, and, but I also think there's something else going on here, you know, this, this dipping into the ancients. As we know from um, David Jones's poetry, you know, from the wonder that is um, in parenthesis, a lot of soldiers had this sense that somehow the Great War was almost like some, you know, snowball that had accumulated all of the wars of history and had brought them together in one. You know, almost like the Great War was, was kind of the Oxo cube of wars, as it was the concentrated essence of every bit of human martial history had come together. Pat Barker puts it you know, beautifully, doesn't she, in Regeneration, she puts words into Owen's mouth where he says something like, you know, at night alone in the trenches, you can feel something ancient. It's almost easier to believe that the skulls, you know, and the skeletons are the remnants of Marlborough's armies rather than our own comrades, you know, this sense of ancient ghosts. So I think um, a couple of things are going on there. There's the aesthetic that the um, Holden is looking for, but also his sense of how all of the war, uh, the world's wars, have somehow been boiled down in, into the Great War. And seen again, you know, it, it, this interest in the Assyrian, um, those bas reliefs, that the war narratives of Assyrian bas reliefs, you know, with, with their kind of hyper realities, he brings in to his war memorials, and particularly the Royal Artillery Memorial, you know, which, which has that real um, Assyrian feel um, going on. But again, I, say, I think this is more than aesthetics. It's, it's his sense um, that they are, you know, as David Jones says, stomping in the footsteps of Artaxerxes, or, you know, that, that quote from Henry V, restoring the ancient disciplines of the wars. They are, they are treading in these old soldiers' footsteps. Their ghosts come with them. Um, and in these, you know, when, when he's applying this uh, directly, here is the um, the, the bronze uh, bas relief that's commissioned by the British War Memorials uh, Committee, which is meant to go in the Hall of um, Memory. So this is his no man's land bronze relief, you know, which is for indoor um, uh, display, and of course. What he's celebrating there as well, what, what comes out, another great theme of his um, memorials is endurance and fortitude. You know, endurance and fortitude as the great heroic 
qualities shown by the army. And note the quote that, that is put in to No Man's Land. It's from Beatrix Bryce Miller, you know, now a forgotten poet, very big at the time, found one of the co-founders of the Eat League. And this is from her poem about the original BEF, the old contemptibles, you know, that 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 um, small, oh, 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 little mighty band that stood for England for a living shield and guarded her slow awakening. So, you know, there's also a celebration of the original BEF and the qualities it sort of bequeathed to later armies of endurance and fortitude being um, uh, celebrated there. And uh, as you know, you might expect, as a man of the Worcester Regiment, the idea of the early battles, particularly the first Battle of Ypres and Gellivelt, you know, and the Worcesters and the charge and everything else, you know, is a big part of the regimental mythology that he's also carrying around with him. Um, and obviously what he's doing as well, you know, is, is, is replicating wartime qualities um, of endurance and fortitude. The famous punch cartoon, you know, there's the baby 1918 being greeted into the world. And, you know, what is that child writing about the stick it, you know, a sense of just bear with, with forbearance, um, uh, carry the, the load, uh, the burden that you've been asked to shoulder. And obviously very famously in, in um, a back to the wall, this sense of endurance and fortitude. And remember, it's also coming out of an Edwardian world that had produced, um, that had made a hero out of Robert Falcon Scott. Um, you know, in his death in Antarctica, which is all about fortitude and endurance, you know, forget the bugger up of the expedition, celebrate the fortitude. Um, it's about uh, British men who stand around on the deck of the Titanic, you know, stiff upper lip, enduring it till the last minute. They will make sure women and children go first. So these are pre-existing um, uh, kind of concepts in Edwardian, late Victorian Britain, which are valorised all over again in the Great War. And I think Holden see through in his memorials. And endurance, I mean, there's it summed up, isn't it? Endurance and fortitude. These guys aren't going to be shifted. And interestingly, they have their backs to the wall as well. You know, here we stand and we are not going any further. And that sense of creating barriers, you know, we, we've just looked at the, the bas relief that created a barrier, you know, a, a living shield with their bodies. The way uh, the wipers figure, there it is, um, uh, the city of Melbourne uh, bought a cast of it for part of its war memorial scheme. So there it is in its Melbourne setting. Um, uh, and, and obviously the, the shell carrier from the Royal Artillery Memorial. These men are bastions in their own right. You know, they stand between us and peril, us and disaster, um, and they do so. They, they are not going to be shifted. So endurance and fortitude being um, uh, celebrated um, uh, hugely here. The fascinating thing, though, here is um, that his sculptural figures, you know, as you can see there, are passive. They don't do anything. And of course, that in its own way emphasizes their solidity, you know, the fact that they're not going to be shifted. Um, they are rooted to the spot. And, you know, here he's Belgian and, and British soldier in their position, uh, their arms reverse position of, um, of you know, of, of respect, military respect for, for the dead. But they're, they're solely passive. Where the action comes in with um, Sergeant Jagger is in the bas relief. So you get this incredible contrast. You know, you get drama in the passive figures, and then you get the drama of narrative in the bas relief. So here on the Anglo-Belgian War Memorial, you have these amazing details of, of Belgian civilians fleeing from the onslaught. And you, and you can see uh, that there's you know, a real sense of dynamism there. We know these figures are moving, that they're active. They, they are, are, are given um, agency and dynamism, you know, despite being caught um, you know, forever in, in stone. And here, um, is is where you see that 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 contrast. So you can see the the, the bronze figures, and then the the um, anti aircraft gunners. There you can see um, you know uh, um, firing away in in the bas relief. So we get the absolute contrast going on there. And of course, the great quality of having that the bronze figures uh, passive is that in doing so, 
they demand silence of you because they are doing nothing, because they are just staring, you know, like kind of Clint Eastwood in a, in a spaghetti western. They've got a thousand yard stare. That arrests you in your movement. It makes you silent and it makes you still. So there are, you know, you know, as you can probably work out, I, I'm a kind of uncritical admirer of Sergeant Jagger and the effect that he creates, that there's this movement between drama and movement in the bas relief, and then the rooting of you to the spot um, as you contemplate the, the bronze figures. Um, and there, you know, uh, again, we get it. So they're, they're passive, but as I've been, but I said, they are totally and utterly immovable. You know, these guys you want in a rugby pack, right? You know, they're, they're not going to shift in, in the scrum, are they? Nothing is going to get past them. Um, they are, um, they, you know, there is a hyper-masculinity uh, about all of this. And, and again, the contrast. So the active gunners in, in, the, in the stone bus release, there's always is lots of energy, lots of action, but they're deliberately contrasted with passivity and um, a uh, 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 sort of uh, fortitude. We're also getting here, particularly in the Royal Artillery Memorial, you know, what Jagger gives you in this riot of activity in the bas relief. You know, they are incredibly busy, those reliefs, as I'm not sure, you know, anyone who's stood there and seen them will know. He lives out the Royal Artillery motto, doesn't he? Ubike, you know, everywhere. We are everywhere. We did everything, you know, whether it's... Um, uh, an observer there who suddenly has to defend himself against air attack. You can see his range finder down against the wicker um, uh, of the trench, but he's having a go, you know, on his um, um, Lewis gun. There's the observer looking through his box periscope, and you can see the trench mortar there and the lovely little details, you know, like the uh, bayonet driven into the um, wall of the trench so he can hang his kit on it. So again, all the details though that, that a only you know a veteran could bring to it um, and would understand. And, and what I love as well, you know, the, the, the tiny detail, that hinge um, that is is that the, the pivot on that uh, Lewis gun, you, you almost feel that it that it's been um, you know lubricated with mercury, that it would move if you went and, and tipped it. Um, you know, and again, it, all those resonances like of, of, of uh, cemetery gates on the ironwork of the IWGC. You know, was it Blomfield that said everything should make a satisfying clunk? You know, and, and you do feel that here in stone, um, it almost does turn into the metal thanks to the, um, thanks to the genius of, of Sergeant Jagger as a sculptor. But yes, we definitely get Ubike, the Royal Artillery, in its multifaceted role throughout the war. Um, and here, you know, the the, the signalers um, in action, the forward signalers. You see the man on, on his stomach with with his field telephone. Um, the, the officer looking forward, uh, or the, the signaler, the other signaler with his flags. You can see there the intensity of their activity. Um, incidentally, uh, you're, um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, Gilbert Ledwood puts a very similar relief on uh, the guards or memorial of, of the artillery signalers um, in action on his bronze reliefs uh, on that, which you, you might argue actually the bronze reliefs on the Royal Artillery Memorial are a little bit more interesting than, than the um, uh, figures themselves. Another quality that I think comes out, and it's a quality which only a man who's been in the trenches can understand, is claustrophobia. You know, is the intensity of human flesh against one another, you know, um, how they came up against one another. And he even compresses it now, you know, into, into the actual battlefield space. It's not just within the trenches, it's in battles themselves. And, and of course, he can emphasize this most strongly in a battle like the first Battle of Ypres, which we might say, you know, is the last of the great old fashioned battles of, of, the, of the Western Front, you know, before the great trench stasis sets in and you get the, what we might call the great modern battles of the First World War. And indeed, you know, he shows you the horror of what happens when armies do come to close quarters in a war of 
chemical energy, you know, releasing propellants. It can still come down to humans clubbing and whacking each other. Um, what you can't see there is the signpost says Gelevelt that's behind them. The signpost that also looks suspicious like a crucifix. You know, so this sort of sense of, of martyrdom. Gelevelt, you know, we're back to his Worcester's um, element there. But look at the soldier whose rifle was actually splintered and smashed, and he's using it as a club um, against uh, the, the the Germans. Um, and and but again, we get those horizontals, don't we? The the, the length increased by the the Germans with their rifles and bayonets. So our eye is dragged along them as they're sort of being prodded in, into flesh. Look at the the ghastly grimace on this man's face, you know, as he, as he is um, um, you know yelling at, at the enemy, and then almost the human it becomes medieval, like a German soldier has become a battering ram. And I suppose you know they are almost medieval in their pickle halber helmets, you know, these incredible remnants of an earlier age which they're they're still wearing. So this sense of war at the cross, uh, literally at a crossroads, you know, the Gellervelt crossroads and technologically and emotionally at a crossroads, I think he's picking up here, but this terrible sense of claustrophobia, you know, it's a world of, of, of claustrophobic activity, which the, which the trenches, you know, is going to emphasize. So here at Combray, you know, in the Louverval Memorial, he gives you tunnel vision, the claustrophobia of the trenches. We do not see the horizon here. You know, he's saying this is the lot of soldiers. You stare down these tunnels um, and you might see blokes going over your head and into battle across you. You know, but you live in these cuttings in the earth and see a world you know, made up of weird cross sections. You never get the full picture. So, you know, th there shall I speak, is, is the veteran on an IWGC memorial, you know, in the middle of France, telling all visitors, this is what life was like in the trenches. You know, uh, and, and that, that um, also that sense of, of humanity, obviously, you know, of comrades helping each other, the wounded soldier there, and the sheer clumsiness, you know, of trying to live. Um, uh, in the trenches, you know, those poor guys trying to shift that stretcher round. Their physical activity um, is is absolutely apparent. You know, you can feel the weight of that stretch. You can feel the the you know, you can see here those guys kind of say, "This is a bugger of a job. We've got to try and swing him round in here, you know, and get him out of it and 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 uh, get him to safety." How do we do it? Um, you, you sense um, their labour is absolutely um, perceptible in his work. Claustrophobia here seen in no man's land um, as well, the, the, the tightness of the bodies. Um, and, uh, but again, notice the horizontals, the man stretching out, you know, almost McCray-like, is he passing on the torch there? Is he throwing on um, uh, uh, the torch? But those, that, cl that clustering, of bodies, the, the, this thickness, you know, of, of bodies um, together. It, it is a claustrophobic world here that he gives us. And at the same time, he's giving us the box periscope view, isn't he? That's what I think about it, uh, the No Man's Land bas relief. It's an almost perfect snapshot through a box periscope. The man who knows no man's land, the man who knows the kit of the army, the man who is talking to his fellow veterans. You know, I am going to celebrate you and what you did, what you endured. It's, it's there so uh, strongly throughout. The other thing that he, I think he's clearly doing with all of these figures is that thing of turning every man into a hero, you know, and, and not just every man, but the working class man. That the in that really, particularly, you know, when you're a gunner, you are like an industrial worker of a machine. I'm sure, you know, we all know that that wonderful thing. What is it that John Keegan says in uh, the face of battle that that a machine gun operator really had exactly the same existence as a lathe operator. You know, what was it? He says a, a series of semi-prepared parts comes towards him 
and with a simple repetitive action, you know, he transforms them into something else, you know, sort of spitting out death at the, at the enemy. So the, the industrial worker becomes soldier who is then a minder or a servant of a, of a literal, you know, military machine. Um, I think it's something Holden, uh, sorry, uh, Sergeant Jaguar is picking up on, and he's turning these guys, industrial worker, soldier, hero, they are all of that in one. Um, and here, yeah, I think you, you see it so strongly um, at, at Paddington, the ordinary guy, the soldier worker, hero. And, and of course, at Paddington, um, for the Great Western Railway Memorial, I think to have a letter in the soldier's hand is perfect, isn't it? The railway station, as we know, is the portal between the home front and fighting front, the bit where the, civil, the man begins to resume his civilian life on his way home, uh, you know, on leave, and where he begins to resume his military life on his way back to the front. And the letter, of course, is the thing that connects him with home continually. So to have a railway memorial where there is a soldier reading a letter, letters that are delivered by railway, you know, and put onto the railway steamers for, for taking over to France, you know, it's just such a beautiful little touch that we get there and it also of course it keeps these men human and it keeps a foot in their civilian camp because he seems to be saying that these guys accept the lot of the soldier they take on the raiment of the soldier you know but the vast majority of us were not professional soldiers we came from civilian life and we were going to go back to it so all of those messages you know brought together in this incredible memorial um, uh, uh, Paddington. And there, the, the, the close-up, you know, that the, the soldier worker hero um, uh, uh, staring at his letter, you know, is it from his wife, uh, greetings from the kids, and is he going, is he coming, and not, not quite answered, uh, you know, it's, it's left for you to, to contemplate at platform one as you've walked on past the Paddington there, um, little seat um, to, to look at that. that that's, you know, he sort of, it's, it's kind of lovely, charming in its own way that he shares the same platform with, with Paddington Bear now. Um, and I mean, the other thing that we have to, to bring out, of course, is the hyper masculinity here. I mean, these guys are not just men. They are bloody big men, aren't they? They are slightly larger than life. Like, you know, they're, they're eight, uh, seven and a half, eight feet tall. So, you know, bigger than, than, uh, than the vast majority of people who was particularly urbanized working class British men, they're bigger than. But, you know, I think Jagger is saying we all grew in that stature. You know, as just as Charles Carrington is going to say, you know, literally working class men grew on army rations and a bit of fresh air, you know, their chest expansions increase. It's almost, you know, we, we grew in to our um, role as men. And there is a, a terrifying hyper masculinity, you know, that, that grip on the rifle in wipers and, and at Hoylake. Um, oh, every time I see that grip, you know, I do think of Rupert Brooks' piece with hand made sure, clear eye and sharpened power. You know, we turn as swimmers into cleanness leaping. That is a sure, clear eye. These guys terrify me when I look at them, you know, because they really do. I don't know how, how you feel when you look at them, but to me, it emphasizes bloody hell, Mark. You really are one of the wheezy lads with a with a note from Matron, aren't you? Your job is to sit on on the sidelines. I will never be a bloke like these guys. I mean, look at me. I'm wearing glasses. I'm never going to be like them. They can crack walnuts in their butt cheeks, right, and do it with, with barely a flinch of the muscle. Um, and it, it's you know the, the fact though, of course, that what I think Jagger is doing is saying is actually saying ordinary blokes became this in their they joined a band of brothers, they joined comrades, and they grew into this mantle. Um, and the other fascinating thing that's happening here, you know, is particularly in the Royal Artillery, as we know, you know, it is a gunner's war. And we know as well, you know, from looking at the, the, the Wyndham Lewis paintings, you know, that the way that the men become like insects, you know, in a battery shell, don't they, with their exoskeletons, you know, serving their gun masters. Um, so we have the, the apogee of what the Industrial Revolution can produce, you know, this kind of terrifying apogee. But in the end, for all of these machines, all of these weapons, they will do nothing unless they are serviced 
by huge amounts of human and animal muscle power. It takes human might to put them into action. And that's what we get, muscle power here. You know, it is war as work. It is hauling, pushing, pulling, dragging. That is what Sergeant Jagger gives you, particularly in the Royal Artillery Memorial there. You know, you can see, again, palpable the sense of labor and strain and sweat. Um, it's obvious. There, the, the, the gunner, you know, the, the pulling on these taut wires to get the gun out of the muck and moving, the shoving. Um, this, say, for, for all of, um, you know, the, the Mond, Com Brunner Mond Company producing its chemicals to chuck out 9.2 inch howitzer shells, um, they don't get there unless these guys and these horses deliver uh, and do the job, nothing happens. And in the mass bulk and power of these, I think another great trick that uh, Jagger gives us to emphasize that is the use of the great coat. You know, and the great coat is a fascinating item, isn't it? You know, it's one of those ones that is kind of standard issue, but a soldier won't have it all the year round. Um, and, and so in some ways kind of um, is, is the symbol of taking on the cloak, quite literally the cloak of state service. But as we also know, you know, as we know from Don Estelle, you know, in in our Hot Mum, it's the one big bit of military kit, isn't it, apart from Tropical Order Short, where if your stature isn't right, you're going to look a burk in the great coat. You, know, you have to fill it. The shoulders have to fill it to make it look good. And Sergeant Jagger gives you men who can fill their great coats. And it almost becomes like a medieval armor. He makes them like knights with these things. Um, look at it there, you know, a draped over, you know, his layer of protection becomes his great coat. And of course, the beautiful juxtaposition we have here between civilian and state military servant. The, the, um, the, the, the state military badge of the great coat and the beautiful thing, which we saw in the painting right at the start of the homemade scarf. Is that his mum or his wife? Did she knit that and send it to him? So his two identities summed up, you know, these, these very simple uh, little bits of clothing um, that, that are juxtaposed very deliberately there. Here, I mean, the driver on the Royal Artillery Memorial, he is like a mounted knight, isn't he? He's waterproof sheet, another one of those, you know, bits of, of uh, kind of non-standard issue kit that, that you got um, uh, given. Um, and look at the way the horse bits almost make him seem like some sort of medieval knight, perhaps with a mace or something. So that there is um, something you know, remarkable about the way he depicts the accoutrement um, of, the, of the soldiers on, on the Royal Artillery Memorial. Um, and there, uh, you know, we're just back to that same point, are we? Mass bolt power, as I've said before, you know, you are not going to get past these guys. To use the cliche, you know, the buck stops with them. Um, uh, um, here I stand, you know, we will do not shift. They shall not pass. Um, here it is um, in bronze. The other thing that I think um, uh, Sergeant Jagger deliberately emphasizes are boots. Now, of course, boots, like army boots, you know, equated with, with the working class boot. The working class boot, you know, was something comic. Um, we all know Lonnie Donegan, right? He looks a proper banana in his great big hobnail boots. He's got such a job to take them off. He calls them Daisy Root, um, which, you know, he, he transposes and becomes my old man's a bus. So from being something, you know, a bit like clogs, which were um, part of the, the, you know, the clod hopping working class, Jagger, just look at boots. They become the badge of noble war service. And here, you know, with that fabulous detail, he's got the putties tied round them. And, and David Jones there, you know, that, that's what we get thickly grieved, don't we, with mud. Um, but the boot is, his army boot is his symbol um, of who and what he is, you know, and what he endured. The clean boots, you know, of the man who's probably going back um, with his perfect putties you know, on the platform um, uh, at Paddington. 
the uh, the driver with his wonderful gaiters, you know, on um, on uh, the the exterior side, the side that goes against the horse, you know, because he doesn't want it, he won't want it to rub um, against the tracing, so he just has his um, footies. But then the side where the splash comes up, you know, the, these great leather gaiters. So so the boot, you know, and and the the the, the gaiter and the putty become these extraordinary badges of um, endurance, heroic work, you know, and, and um, the, the differentiation between us and them, them, they who really knew the war at its worst. And, and there, the officer with, with his nice gaiter tags, but he's one of them, you know, he wears his boots too and has his great coat hanging down. And so, you know, where, where we can do our little, um, uh, side glance to someone like Philip Lindsay Clark, another veteran sculptor, what we see here, far from them being, you know, Wilfredo impassive sufferers, these men actively conquer the conditions of war. So there at the Borough High Street, you know, every time I see that with him advancing through the slough of despond, I think of William Noel Hodgson's The Call, you know, was when the summons in our ears were shrill, steadfast in our trust we rose and flung but not a backward glance and went strongly forth to do the work of men you know there it is isn't it the slough of despair um conquered by these guys and there's sergeant jaggers um a sentry figure for the s and j watts cotton warehouse in manchester you know it's now in um it's now a, a hotel and it's still proudly displayed in its niche in, in the hotel lobby but again no, notice that the sandbags wrapped around him these are not like uh gilbert ledwood's perfect guardsmen are they on, on the guards memorial um these are guys who have to stand around in, in their trenches but the flip side is, you know, he also shows us he's got this remarkable fixation for this detail of soldiers who lose their boots, you know, and that shows their vulnerability. It strips them down to mere mortals. So we get these details like in, in, in the um, uh, uh, bas relief of No Man's Land, like at Louvreval, you know, many had lost their boots, but all limped on, as Owen says in, in Dolce uh, Decorum Est. And that, exposes the flip side that they are vulnerable humans. They are, they are vulnerable and they are killed because metal penetrates human flesh. And there is pain, that lovely detail at Louvreval, those fingers wrapped round the edge of the stretcher. Is that because, you know, he's either being carried out of the trench or lowered into it and he's worried about slipping? And is the slipping causing intense pain? You know, those knuckles are white. It strikes me as he digs them in, um, uh, gripping on. So pain is there for all this hyper masculinity. You know, Sergeant Jagger is not denying the reality of what war does. Um, and there's pain though and comradeship. Look at the way that gunner with these huge hands is cupping the head of his comrade. You know, and they're getting him out of it. They're going to get him out of danger. They're going to get him help they're not going to leave him there but then that emphasis on the vulnerability of flesh you know he has this gunner stripped to the waist down and he's injured now as well and they're getting him out um i always think you know when, when i see this uh, of, of this of the battle of the song film you know uh, it, it's remarkable it strikes me that, that we're, we're almost seeing it you know um put into into different form in stone there and finally of course we do get death we get noble death. We get another unknown warrior on the Royal Artillery Memorial. And of course, he emphasizes the horizontal as he lays out on his catafalque there. So the ultimate you know, um, end of so much of this for so many men is not denied. And we're put in touching distance of death. But of course, he gives the consolation to wives, you know, to, to widows, to mothers, to sisters. He doesn't show you the ultimate reality of what we know artillery does, dismembering, you know, uh, knocking off heads, ripping off limbs. He does give you the perfection of a whole figure. And he lets you stare, and you can see the, a bit of the profile, you know, the, the, the jawbone and the ear you can see. 
and it's almost like with that those incredibly um uh, uh you know sumptuous folds you feel that you know, what if you could if you could lift the 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 gas cape and and the the great coat you know would you and what would you see often when i'm standing i think of you know it's probably we're, we're just about in the right season aren't we you know uh, where, where the, the ghost of christmas yet to come shows scrooge what's clearly him on the bed and he's pointing at the sheet you know for scrooge to lift it and see himself and scrooge knows it's himself but you know he's, he's too scared to do it you know what would we see there would we almost see a doppelganger you know but for what these guys did this could have been us they stepped into this breach in our place and we get though he says he affirms the cause he says that every you know death it was present amongst us the whole time but he gives you henry v does it and he makes you think about it am i being ironic am i being straight you must stand here and think here was a royal fellowship of death is it you know inscribed just as Lutchins does it to you at Tierval, you know, where he gives you the thing, the missing of the Somme, and he stops you dead there. Think about it. What does it mean? And, and, and just as the figures arrest you, the inscription arrests you. But we also get death in action, you know, so the reality of death in action. And again, though, the dynamism there, you know, as that driver is hit in the chest by the bullet, you can feel the tension on the reins can't you in the way it's making the horses rear as he's forced bodily backwards by impact so we do get depiction of the reality of what occurs you know on, on, on the battlefields and behind the lines and we get it shows me doorways to death you know uh, uh, one of the, the weird things is the setting at paddington he is standing in front of like this incredibly uh, it's austere but you know, a sumptuous doorway. What is it? it? It's almost like he's standing in the doorway of a tomb. It's like a mausoleum, you know, like you know, I always think of Julius Beer, his, his great mausoleum in Highgate Cemetery. So there's this door. Um, so does he stand between us and death? Is he turning, you know, to go through the portal of death once he's read that letter? Is that what he did? He went through the portal of death in order to save us so that we don't have to go through it. And that door always makes me think of that lovely bit, you know, that incredible bit right at the end of the film version of Oh, What a Lovely War, you know, when, when the last British soldier in the war is killed, uh, isn't it? And, and the, the door in the dugout is opened, you know, and he goes down his own, down uh, some uh, profound dull tunnel, um, long since scooped through granites, you know, this portal of death. So it, it's, um, it's a sobering uh, reality, a symbolic and sobering reality that he with Thomas Tate, the architect who works on that with him, and they work together on the Port Tufik Memorial, of course, for, for, for the commission they, they give you there. And but I say, I think it's a, Russia, it's, a, it's a righteous war. You know, here we get Prussianism quite literally crushed underfoot. The pickle halber is, is there. We did do the right thing. It was bloody awful. It was bloody terrible, but we did the right thing. And all the more reason for us to think about it to make sure it doesn't happen again. Making sure it doesn't happen again doesn't mean you think you, you know, wasted everybody's lives first time round, but you've got to learn the lesson. And then the contrast here, though, is how humanity seems so vulnerable and fragile so here's the figure of humanity at hoylake and west kirby and you know she, you could almost be mistaken for thinking she's one of those medieval you know grim reapers but here the laurel wreath um she holds it aloft and you can see it's broken the chains of slavery and war that's been achieved by the sacrifice but look that the generations yet to come are symbolize this tiny babe in this pouch round her neck that tiny tiny you know if, if the soldiers are bigger than than life size this baby you know it's, it's kind of fetal it, you know it's, it's, it's not fully gestated um and so it's incredibly vulnerable and, and i think what jagger seems to be saying there is you know peace that the qualities of humanity can be vulnerable we have to keep reflecting on who and what we are and the world we want to be in because it can be so easily trampled so 
you know, think about your lives, think about our world. There seems to be a deliberate, very, very deliberate vulnerability and fragility to humanity there. Now, what about some of the, let joy be unconfined, you know, I'm coming towards uh, the end, I'll be shutting up very, very soon. Um, what about some of the, the reactions to these memorials? Well, the, the Royal Artillery Memorial, as I'm sure a lot of you know, you know causes I immense um, uh, uh, debate. Um, the, the problem that is asked by a lot of art critics, you know, and those who fancy themselves as high esthetes, is can the function of a war memorial like this actually coexist with the, qual the true qualities, you know, of art and the symbolic functions of a war memorial. So um, here's um, the, the, the Daily Telegraph, you know, giving um, its review, uh, saying, you know, that, that there, there is, uh, there's no mistaking a, a giant howitzer, you know, that fills your eye. And, and it's discussing this very fact, you know, they're saying that there is, there is no St. George here. Um, there is no, uh, bear, it says that ruthlessly bear of Christian symbolism. It is sheer realism. It is no idealized gun which thrusts its mouth to the sky. So there is a, an absolute sort of verisimilitude and reality here. But is that art? Is that truly a war memorial? You know, and, and of course, being that it's so close to the, the Victory Memorial, you know, with Quadriga at the top of it, um, and, and also the slightly funny thing that Adrian uh, Jones, uh, uh, and sorry, uh, Francis Derwent Wood is going to do with, with the Machine Gun Corps Memorial, you know, and, it, and it's uh, David, um, that there's, there's some things to discuss about the, the, the sculpture around Hyde Park Corner. So there are some mixed reactions. It does, of course, for gunners, it talks to gunners. And, and I think that's the point that Sergeant Gagger is doing. You know, he says to people, I was commissioned by the Royal Artillery War Memorial Committee. They wanted a gun. And as we know, guns are colours in the Royal Artillery. Guns also are trophies. So he almost makes a piece of massive regimental silver in stone here. And I think this is what Jagger is saying. You know, forget what you understand as a war memorial. Here was a new type of war, and I'm producing a new type of memorial. And the people that I really want to talk to are the gunners. They have paid for it. It's their memorial. So he's, you know, obviously in a regimental memorial, he's placing the community of veterans above that of the civilian bereaved. You know, that, that's the, the conversation uh, he wants to have. Now, Ian Hamilton was asked, and he said, this, this isn't his words, he quoted, um, you know, Lord Curzon, of course, does fancy himself as a bit of an SD, is going to have the great Bertrand McKennell, you know, designing the um, the, the family uh, uh, tombs there. Um, and so, you know, Hamilton said, Curzon had said to him, um, it's the, the ugliest thing in the world is a gun, with one exception only a howitzer. A howitzer resembles a toad squatting, which is about to spit fire out of his mouth, out of its mouth. Nothing more hideous could be conceived. Um, but say, if you look at it from the other point of view of proud gunners who service their gun, you know, for, and a gun is a color, this um, is everything. And some critics do realize that. The Manchester Guardian realizes it. They say, look, the sweating, straining, suffering men and beasts in the panels have a passionate realism and the children of a future age will see in them war without the gloss. Um, so they see a potent message in it. Um, it's it's art critic. Same with, with country life. You know, it mentions those those who decry it and talks about the juxtaposition with the machine gun corps memorial that sees some deeper quality um, uh, in, in this memorial. And of course the gunners themselves queue up for it. So here's McGregor Knox, you know, li literally firing his salvo saying you know as as a gunner this is what we want the gunner memorial is nothing if not real and there's the fascinating thing is it saying that a, that a, a you know a true great war memorial should perhaps drop some of its language of um, uh, sim, um, symbolism and illusion and cut straight to reality because the irony is in, in its own way as we know the, the royal artillery memorial is an essay in a kind of hyper realism and almost 
medieval Bayeux tapestry, um, I say Assyrian bas relief symbolic actions. But within that, it is telling the truth about uh, uh, the war. So it strikes me it's the apogee of art. You know, if, if what is it, you know, to paraphrase Picasso, um, artists lie in order to tell the truth, you know, because they construct something. It's not the actual reality of something going on, but they, they are telling you the deeper truth uh, that, it, that it conceals. And I think the Royal Artillery Memorial uh, does that perfectly. So there, I'm gonna shut up um, uh, now. I hope that was of um, some uh, interest. Um, yeah, once again, I think what we, we you know, I just shut up by saying um, that all of these memorials, um, uh, you know, as I'm sure you all know, that as I keep sort of saying that they are the antithesis, really, of the modern world. They're there for us to stop and, and drink them in over quite a long time, you know, and something like the Royal Artillery Memorial, which to me is the finest war memorial in Britain, um, just demands hours you know take yourself a, a deck chair and just sit a, around it and, and look at it anyway i'll shut up i'll let questions um, uh, um thank you all for listening mark that was absolutely splendid thanks ever so much indeed I, i'll never look at a, a war memorial in the same way again uh, especially especially jaggers that that was a truly eye-opening uh, exposition of, of what we can get out of uh, these war memorials. Ladies and gentlemen, hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And if you can show, show our appreciation in the usual way by uh, doing a virtual round of applause via the hand raising routine on on, uh, on Zoom. And Mark, I can tell you that there's hundreds of hands being raised. So That's just very uh, kind. Thank uh, you very much. Take, take that as, as a round of applause. So it's, it's question and answer time now, everybody. Mm. So um, David Sir has asked the following question. I'm going to read David's question out because. His um, IT uh, won't uh, uh, enable him to, 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 to come up and, and ask you the question. So David's question was, the uh, statement's question was this. Mark, thank you for portraying so enthusiastically the intensity that most feel when standing in front of Jagger's work. The art critic Brian Sewell thought the Royal Artillery Memorial, one of the very greatest British works mm. of the 20th century, and said mm. that it if he ever had enough money, he would move uh, the memorial bodily away from Grosvenor Place so that people could actually appreciate it comfortably without being run over a, by a bus. Yeah. And, and, and slightly tongue-in-cheek, David says, perhaps there ought to be a campaign to get it moved. Um, so, <laughs> so whilst, whilst you absorb that, I'm just going to grab some quite some folk and, and, and um, get some questions um, up. Okay, so first up, Peter. Um, Pete, do you want to unmute yourself, Peter? I was, I was stunned by that, Mark. I was um, oh, thank you. absolutely knocked out. Um, I've typed a question, which I'm going to be very cheeky and substitute another question for, if ah, I may. The people will do all this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, it's fine. Go on, Peter. Just, uh, um, in looking at particularly the uh, depiction of the, um, the body laid out towards the end, sort of prompted me to change my thinking, really. Mm. You, you called it the consolation of the perfect body. Mm. And yet, there's a, a real paradox or juxtaposition between that depiction of, of death and some of the really graphic detail in the, in the bas reliefs around Absolutely. the memorial. Yeah. And I was just wondering whether there was any public response to being shown the reality of war in that mm. way than what was perhaps the Victorian Edwardian sense of, of, a, of a, a heroic and um, sacrificial death. And, and if so, what was the response of Sergeant Jagger to it? Yeah, um, well, uh, uh, you know, th there are some great stills. Um, I didn't, you know, I was showing so many pictures uh, of Sergeant Jagger on unveiling day, you know, in, in his morning suit with his hat, chest stuck out, you know, looking every inch Jack the Lad, really. You know, he, uh, very clearly very proud of it. And very similar, funnily enough, it is something, you know, you know that famous uh, portrait photograph that, that Wyndham Lewis had done of himself in, in his artillery gear. He's got the fag hanging out, you know, yeah, and again, yeah. he looks Jack the Lad. Um, uh, so, yeah, Sergeant Jack, you always came back to the same point, um, which is, I was building this Oh, yeah, I, I was commissioned to this by a very particular community, and which, which is gunners. You know, it, it's the it's the Royal Artillery. So it's them I'm speaking to. It is kind of their job to translate it to their family and friends who weren't there. 
Uh, and so a lot of the so a lot of the sympathetic coverage, you know, which did notice that things like some widows were you know were totally nonplus because it is so in your face, you know, mm -hmm. and, and at you uh, uh, around the throat. Um, and and there is you know no hold barred in it that it, it you know very different to you know say the Britannia that he carves for for Bedford, you know, a beautiful Britannia that he does for the Bedford War Memorial. But again, you know, he just they all constantly relied upon this thing that it's a military memorial for a military community mm -hmm. and you know therefore ask the blokes and get them to explain it to you and, and they um you know it kind of sounds too defensive to say they hid uh, behind that but they just use that as their explanation uh, mm -hmm. and it was then pretty much so either come to terms with it or reject it. You know, Sergeant Jagger was, was kind of bluff enough to say, if you reject it, fine. You know, I, I'm, I'm not, well, that's fine. Um, but, you know, here it is, and it ain't changing. Um, and, and he did make that that statement. Uh, and, you know, coming back to, to the, uh, the the first point, so when they were considering the, the access for it, um, almost by accident, you know, they, they swiveled it round to put it so that the gun is facing, you know, north-south, so that the muzzle is facing south. And of course, that works perfectly because symbolically it's facing the battlefront. It's facing France. Now, I got my lad, uh, my 14 year old, who's much better using Google Earth and doing all that than me. And we worked out that the, that the shell, if you did a perfect trajectory, would land somewhere behind the Somme lines. Um, but would, would have been right in the middle of the 1918 retreat battlefield. So, you know, it fires out um, uh, that way. So even it, its axis ends up being perfect, you know, as well. So it is beautifully uh, placed. Thank you for that. And did you, very quickly, did you notice that on the um, the, the other side of the Hoylake Memorial, um, the laurel wreath you described, to me, it looked like a crown of thorns as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Very definitely. Yeah, yeah, that there's this there's a tiny gap between your and victory and sacrifice are connected, just as of course they are in in, you know, in Christianity. That, that as we know, Christ's victory comes through the agony of the crown of thorns, yeah. and, and and you know, and his symbol of victory are also his symbols of agony. Um, and also, what's fascinating about the the, the Hoylake Memorial is. Um, that he, he kind of reverses where you might expect to see the figures. So the soldier has got his back to the sea and is facing inland and the figure of humanity. Now she looks out over the sea. Now you might say that's because, you know, humanity should look out on the broad horizon, you know, of the coast and where the sun will come. Um, but, you know, a simplistic defensive narrative might say you should have the soldier you know, looking out to see, because that's where the enemy might come from. So he does all sorts of funny little things, which all of them, you know, it should be just are, are there to arrest you and make you think. Um, just mull it over. Yeah. You really have to chew them over. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Peter. Um, Bill Twist. Bill, um, your microphone's live. I don't think you've got a video, but do you want to ask a question there? Uh, Mark, thank you very much indeed. It, it, a marvellous, uh, you know, a real tour de force. And, and so, thank you so much for a multicultural tour. Um, you mentioned the British War Memorials Committee mm. early on. Mm. Who allocated or who commissioned which memorials? Why did Sergeant Jagger end up with the Royal mm. Artillery in the Hoylake and West Kirby, for example? Yeah, that, that's fascinating because... Um, Really, the British one you know, um, grows out of the Canadian War Art Scheme, and, and of course, the, the millionaire behind the Canadian War Art Scheme is Beaverbrook, you know, and he's chucking a lot of money at that very early on, and he takes advice from uh, a lot of the leading art critics, and he, you know, he's very good because he actually picks up some of the, the the those who support the new avant garde, and they tell him that. You know, what you can't do is just get all of the great old names, the ones who are not old enough, you know, the ones who are too old to serve um, and would never be picked anyway. You've got to get the authentic voice. So he immediately, you know, starts chucking money at people like Nevinson at Wyndham Lewis to produce money uh, to produce art for the Canadians, which is why they have such a wonderful collection as well. Now, of course, what with him also operating in Britain, you know, and then becoming, as we know, Minister of Information, 
he very rapidly says, you know, Britain's got to have exactly the same thing. And so he replicates the thing that what you've got to have are the, the artists who are actually serving, you know, why the Nash brothers, are, you know, are approached by, when, again, Wyndham Lewis um, is, is approached by Nevinson is brought on board. Um, and because there's also then th this feeling um, that the collection should have a mixture of, of some uh, sculptural pieces, you know, and, and they they ask around, and it and the the person that they often ask is Muirhead Bone, you know, the great um, illustrator, you know, who who does uh, that, those wonderful um, propaganda books um, produced under the auspices of Country Life and such like. Um, and Muirhead Bone was was a remarkably um, warm you know man about the, the the generation of artists just beneath him and he's their great champion and he so he knows about sergeant jagger he's heard about him you know through his contact and he says you've got to get this guy you know you, you these are the, this if you want a something in bronze get him uh, and that's why they even start you know they, they talk to epstein as well and then they get that on form terrible involved in, in in the scheme so it's a very, very ambitious scheme, you know, and for that reason, as you know, as I'm sure a lot of people know, the Imperial War Museum, after Tate Britain, has the largest collection of 20th century British art in the world, because in two world wars, the war artist schemes are so extensive, and you know, they're magnificent collections. So it's a, yeah, a very that's a very long-winded response, and for it to a, a, a straightforward question, um, it's a deliberate decision to fish out the best. Of the artists, you know, that are in service, and to get them to make an authentic war record. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your question, there, Bill. Uh, next up, Christopher Nash. Christopher, do you want to un unmute yourself there? Yeah, right. I was just thanking you for your presentation. Uh, my question is partly answered, I think, by the articles and the letters that you showed in your presentation, mm -hmm. and also maybe an answer to some of the earlier questions. But basically, my question is around whether our modern sensibilities view his sculptures more differently than when it was first uh, inaugurated. Yeah. Do we yes. interpret it differently now compared to when it was first, a, you know, as I say? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. of course, you know, because of, shall we say, um, a simplistic reaction um, against the Great War, Sergeant Jagger was rolled in amongst that. You know, he was, um, sh shall we say, at, at the height of the disillusionment bit um, after the Second World War, you know, with the Great War, Sergeant Jagger had glorified war and killing. And the Royal Artillery Memorial was treated with great disdain, you know, by art critics. And, you know, you, you can look through a lot of books about British sculpture published in, in the late 50s and through into the 60s without, you know, with barely a mention of Sergeant Jagger and, and the memorial because it's thought that, say, that he's glorified war. It takes really until the 1980s and, and a reappraisal, partly um, you know, with Gavin Stamp doing the Reba exhibition on the architects of the Imperial War Graves Commission. That sort of starts a rehabilitation to start thinking about these uh, this kind of work in, in a more um, complex and nuanced way. And Sergeant Jagger begins a slow revival. People return to it um, and realise that it isn't a simplistic glorification of war. It's a glorification of the men and everything they endured. It tells you, you know, that, that it respects their regimental traditions and their sense of the, their military community. But, you know, glorification of war, it ain't. You know, that, that's, people have missed the subtle distinctions. Um, and it was only really from the 1980s that that started to be uh, reawakened. It's very interesting, isn't it? Um, you know, that, that low budget, superb little um, Joseph Lucy film about uh, the version of Ham, King and Country with Dirk Bogard you know, and Tom uh, Courtney. In that, those montage credits that he has, which he must have been thinking about the way Joan uh, Littlewood had used slides, you know, what a lovely war. In that, you know, and they're all meant to be ironic, you know, about th this waste of life. In that, there are still images of the Royal Artillery Memorial. You know, and it's clearly, clear that he's using it ironically. And I think that, that's the bit, you know, where, where Sergeant Jagger 
having been misinterpreted and misunderstood is at the bottom of the barrel. And I say it's really from the nine. It, what is it? It's, I think it's 1980 when the Imperial War Museum has the first retrospective since his death, since the Royal Academy exhibition of 1935. And it really is from about 1980 onwards that he begins this sort of slow recovery in status. Great. Th Christopher, thank you for your question. Gerald, uh, unmute yourself. Great. Um, David, um, this gives me a chance both to ask Mark a question, but also most importantly, to thank you and your team, especially Jill, <laughs> for the fantastic way. I know I've thanked you by email, but You've transformed the WFA as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this has been well, it's been a fantastic uh, response to COVID. So we can't go to the old front line, but we do this uh, a couple of times a week, it seems. Great. So, so Mark, my um, first of all, thank you to you. This is fantastic. And you were equally uh, great on, on EAT, I remember, a few, few months ago. Um, uh, strange enough, I've lived in London for well over half my life. Mm -hmm. And one of my... Uh, one of my things I do is, is go to Hyde Park on my way home in normal circumstances late at night. And I may even have had a drink on my way. And what's, um, what's really the thing about Hyde Park Corner is it's two places. Most of us think of it as a roundabout or an underpass, but actually it's a place where people walk and they stand and they stop. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do that increasingly, uh, particularly in the Anzac connection nowadays. Mm -hmm. But what, what I, my real question is this, um, the juxtaposition of the beautiful boy David, um, mm. of the Machine Gun Corps, mm. uh, and this fantastic Royal Artillery um, monument, which as you can gather, I, I really rate, mm. I always have, it's mm. a runner. You talked about it tonight. That juxtaposition, who was in charge of what I would call the planning of this, because mm -hmm. I'm thinking we are pre um, the present planning legislation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, first of all, was it, was it deliberate? Yeah. And secondly, which, who was the governing body on siting? Yes, yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely fascinating. So, it's it's a you know as, as ever with anything to do with um, British government and its strange web, uh, particularly you know, the, the, a web that became even more complex in the 19th century of, of overlapping and intertwined authorities. You've got a number of authorities with their, their you know, claws on this. You've got the Royal Fine Arts Commission um, that, that are having a big say and are very worried about when they see the designs, absolutely petrified. Um, uh, and you've obviously got Westminster uh, City Council that, that's involved um, uh, in it as well. LCC is, is having a little bit of a say, um, you know, because also there are, there are things to do with, with the flow of um, traffic. So there are three, um, yeah, there, there are these three authorities um, involved and they're all of them um, in their own way equally, just as the Royal Artillery was, um, you know, scarred, might be too um, harsh a word to say, um, by the Royal Artillery South African Memorial on the Mall, which had been hugely controversial. You know, it took years to put that up um, because um, that's all part of the Mall you know, redevelopment thing in, in the wake of Queen Victoria's um, uh, Diamond Jubilee, which, which Lord Isha had been uh, chairing. And he hated the uh, Royal Artillery South African Memorial. He said this, it looks like a public urinal because, you know, it's got that, that, that Temenos wall um, and, and the Pegasus on, on the pedestal. And he said, surely tramps are just going to piddle against this the whole time. And that, that's his sort of response. So they're, um, they're all rather sort of panicky um, about, you know, it, it, what's the Royal Artillery going to do this time? So they're all very sensitive, you know, and, and, and bloody hell, it comes up with, a, with another strange memorial as far as they're concerned. So... Um, the thing is, though, because of the status of the Royal Artillery, you know, because of its sheer size uh, you know, and its clout, there is no way it can be denied a very prominent London play, uh, space. And when they make noises that they would like to be, you know, at the other end of the processional way, you know, they've got one right by Admiralty Arch and they're going to be the very other end of, of sort of the Royal Processional Way at Constitution Hill. Um, 
uh, against the other great victory memorial, you know, against Britain's other great dictatorial enemy, Napoleon, they, they can't be stopped. The, the funny thing is, in its own way, is that the, the parvenu core, the new baby infant core that nobody knows what's going to happen to it, you know, the machine gun core manages to get itself at Hyde Park Corner. That's the true surprise, really, that it manages to wedge itself in, in, in such a, a spot. And of course, uh, Francis Derwent Wood with Lutchins had put in for the competition for the Royal Artillery Memorial. Um, and, and both were a little bit put out when they, when they didn't win, hands down. Um, Lutchins designed a sort of very tall pile on Cenotaph that, that, um, and, and Derwood some sculpture for the top of it. Um, and he, Derwood didn't like the idea of a gun, but then funnily enough, of course, integrates them in this weird kind of triptych, doesn't he, on, on the Royal, on the, the Machine Gun Corps Memorial. So um, I don't know if I answered your question there. Um, Yes, the, the, the artillery gets its own way in the end, I think through its power and its influence, um, because there's, there's no stopping it. Although, of course, once they see the designs, the Fine Arts Commission says, um, wouldn't that be, that'd be better off at the Rotunda, wouldn't it? Chuck it in Woolwich. Why don't you put it in Woolwich? It would be nice there. Um, I said, no, 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 it's not going, no one goes to Woolwich. Deep, good, you know, big knobs don't walk around in Woolwich. They walk around here. They, they go in Rotten Row and Hyde Park. The gun is going here. So they hold firm and they get their own way. But until relatively recently, you know, it sits on a traffic island separated from the rest of Hyde Park Corner. Yeah, yeah, but that, that if you don't mind me coming back on, on this, um, so I think the summary, my summary to your answer is they went for location. Fantastic. Yes. Well done. Yeah. Um, but it, this is a real mistake to think that um, it's a traffic island. It isn't. Mm -hmm. You can get to it easily through the subways. Yeah. And, and if I can commend to members the idea of spending 45 minutes or an hour walking around, and most recently the Bomber Command Memorial, very nearby, again connected by subway. But I don't want to take up any, no, any more what, time. You know, originally, Sorry. I was just saying, in, in 1925, it literally is on an island separating it from the rest of Hyde Park Corner. Oh, I see. It okay. flows either side of it. And, and yep, they, yep, they yep. extend the, the paved zone, you know, uh, much later on. I'm um, sorry, I'm living in the world now, and I, you, okay. you've corrected me. But um, both of you, thank you very much. No worries. Thanks, Gerald. Right, next up, Margaret. Margaret's not got a video, but if you just want to mute yourself there, Margaret, your video, yeah. your, your, your audio's live. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. I really enjoyed that. The Great. Royal Artillery Memorial is one of my favourites. I've been there for many, many years, going back and forth, looking at it. And then when they added the Australian uh, mm -hmm. next door to it, I've spent even more time because uh, noticing all the little tiny villages mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. station papers. But on the Royal Artillery, I noticed while you were actually showing the photographs, there was the one of a uh, sculptor actually working on part of the... That's Jagger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just wondered how much of the Royal Artillery Memorial was actually sculpted in situ. Yes, a, a fair bit, actually, um, it is sculpted in situ. And, and again, that's part of Jagger you know, showing the, his interest in the new approaches to sculpture, which was, you know, not to work in the workshop, but to work in situ. Eric Kevington you know, is exactly the same, that, that, that somehow, you know, having the wind and the rain whistling around outside whatever little shed, you know, a lean-to you put up adds um, uh, a, a, a sort of visceral spirit to, to what um, you're doing. So a lot of it is actually done. O obviously the, the bronzes you know, are, are, are cast in, in the workshop from models um, that uh, Jagger creates and he hands that on you know, to, to um, he, a, a team of trusted craftsmen to, to do the final casting that he works with regularly. And indeed he writes an incredible book uh, not long before his death on modeling and sculpting in which you can which he shows the plasticine um, and clay models for the um, artillery memorial. But a lot of the stonework is actually done on site. 
uh, yeah, he, you know, he, he works away uh, and, and finalizes. He has some um, uh, assistants do some work, but you know, he, he's overseeing uh, and doing the vast majority of, of the final um, uh, work. Um, yeah. Would, so, would, it, would that have been for the gun as well? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For the whole. So basically, yeah. did he work it in blocks then? Or? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And could you just um mention the name of the book? That he well, uh, he, his book on modelling. Yeah. Yeah. Hang on. I, I I've got it. Just I can hold it. Uh, Lovely. Thank you. Can you see that? Modelling and sculpture. Okay. Excellent. Yep. Yes, that looks great. Mm. Thank okay. you very much. Not a problem. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, um, well, Margaret stole my, my question, really. <clears throat> I really wanted to know whether um, the work was done in a workshop or on location, and you've kind of answered that. Um, can you tell me where the workshop was? Where, where did Jagger work? And also, oh. are there many existing uh, impressions that he made, uh, drawings that he made in preparation? Yeah, yeah um, obviously, the, the, um, the Royal Artillery... Um, you know, collection now down in it, in Lark Hill. That that's got uh, the, the correspondence of the uh, War Memorial Committee. Um, Reba have got uh, a lot of the the drawings, um, and, and they've got uh, quite a lot of the Holden and Pearson, you know, Pearson's original drawings. Because again, I didn't pick up on what you could see that that Pearson does for the plinth of the Royal Artillery Memorial is give it a hint, a, a cruciform. Um, it, it has the 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 um, you know the the cross section, um, and the Imperial War Museum has got quite a few maquettes um, as well. Unfortunately, some have been lost. I think that would happen when he fell out of favour, you know, and stuff wasn't collected. Um, but you can see his work, you know, in in various other places. Millbank, um, an ICI house, his sculptures on there mm -hmm. on um, Lever House, you know, at, at uh, Blackfriars Bridge. Of course, oh, he's wow. amazing. Um, Shackleton for the Royal Geographical Society. Um, so you know, in London, that there's quite a bit of of uh, uh, Jagger work, but um, yeah, quite a lot of the original maquettes uh, 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 have gone into private collections. But yeah, the Imperial War Museum's got a quite a big collection. And if you want to see the full catalogue of his work and Compton's book on the sculpture of Charles Jagger, it's brilliant. And there's a wonderful catalogue section at the end where, where she gives the, um, the, the, you know, the known provenance of, of where things are now. So you can still <coughs> see things. OK, thank you very much, Mark. A really good talk. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Stephen Roberts. Stephen, do you want to mute yourself there? Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Absolutely beautiful talk. Um, I am from the Hoylake and West Kirby area, and, and the <laughs> memorial is actually what got me interested in the First World War in the first place. Mm. And it links to what uh, David said earlier, that uh, the WFA has some grants available for PhD students. Mm. I benefited from one of those. And I've got my Viva next uh, oh, Thursday, uh, Friday, a week tomorrow, yeah. Wonderful. And just uh, the memorial itself, um, it, it's on Grange Hill, which mm. um, what you get there is absolutely beautiful sunsets. Mm. And mm. A, uh, what interested me is that um, there was a Bronze Age burial urn found in more or less exactly the same spot, which seems to indicate that it already had a, a tremendous numinous quality. Mm. Um, it had done for generations. Mm. Um, yes, uh, I've also made a website if anyone wants to look at it, it's called An Imperishable Record. The mm. name comes from an article which, in the local newspaper, the Birkenhead mm. News in 1922, mm. which described the unveiling of the memorial. So if anyone wants to Great. have a look at that, it's, it's called cool. An Imperishable Record. Mm. But my little question is, um, when I've looked at the soldier there on Grange Hill, I've seen socialist realism. 
Mm. Uh, and you, mm -hmm. you touched on the, the way that mm. they are, they're workers, working mm. class. Uh, do you think the um, similarity between socialist realism is, is a coincidence, or was there a discernible organic link between the two schools of... That, that's a really interesting question. I, um, given the kind of things that Sergeant Jagger was interested in, you know, in the circles that he mixed in, I'm sure he was picking up on um, you know, elements of, uh, of Soviet culture um, and, and uh, you know, what was happening uh, in the arts world in the Soviet Union. But I've never seen a, you know, a deliberate conscious reference to it. But that, that's, that's a fascinating point. There is its own... Um, uh, uh, yes, a sort of British aesthetic take on it there, um, and um, yes, so, so and, and again, I think that though in its, its own way is what leads to it gaining you know, or, or collapsing under the weight of, of detractors by the 1950s, where it can be equated with totalitarianism. You know that that it has that that um, sort of for those who are looking at it simplistically, it seemed to have a ringing bombast to it that they didn't like, that they were reacting against. Um, but yeah, that's a really interesting point. Sorry? Yeah. No, 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 I, sorry, I've, I've muted Stephen, I, I, I beg your pardon, but uh, we're just running slightly out of time, right. so I'm, I'm going to plow on to the next question. Avril, do you want to just unmute yourself there? Yes, hello. Um, first of all, good luck to Stephen uh, with his mm. fiver. Um, I'm just starting out while well, I'm in my second year of a PhD and I'm already quaking in my shoes at the <laughs> of the um, So looking forward to the time when the world begins again, um, mm -hmm. is there an index of where I can find these amazing statues by Jaggers and the other ones that you mentioned in your uh, absolutely brilliant talk? Yeah, you can, if you look on the National Inventory of War Memorials on the Imperial War Museum, um, you, you can see them there. Uh, and as I said, um, Anne Compton's book um, lists them all, as does she wrote the catalogue for, I think, the ninth, it was 1980, the exhibition. Um, so the Imperial War Museum exhibition of Sergeant Jagger, and that's got a full catalogue listing at the back as well. Great, thank you. Thanks. Um, right, I'm going to slip a question in from Richard Owen, um, which is briefly this. As an admirer of Lutyens, I do find the Fiat Val Memorial one giant block of Lego. Convince me otherwise. Uh, it would... Uh, I, I'm very happy to come back and give a talk about Tiat Val <laughs> if, if, if you want. No, no, Tiat Val is the finest war memorial on the Western Front by a very, very long way. Um, it's amazing sense of towering bulk but weightlessness that's what's remarkable you know it, it at one moment it feels like a, a sort of meringue and then the next it is like huge blocks of lego coming and, and it's those juxtapositions of bulk and light and air um which make, I think, Tiet Val so remarkable that the mix between the, the, the Uville, you know, and the, and the Portland and the brick, uh, those contrasts of, of, of shade and, and light. Um, uh, the, the, the way it ascends, you know, that ziggurat pyramid effect that it, that it has, well, the way it drags the eye up, down, round and through. Um, no, 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 t t I, I think the problem about Tietval is uh, that, uh, you know, I'm going to come back to something like bore on about the whole time. Tietval demands that you spend a bloody long time with it because it, it won't give away its secrets easily and, and quickly. And I think that is also part of its genius. You know, Lutchins is saying there are 73,000 missing here. You have to start working on this challenge. Don't walk away quickly. And, and I, yeah, to, to me, it's a work of genius. Very happy to come back and give a talk about it yeah, at some point if you want. Brilliant. That is that, Mark. Last question, Philip Bentham. Philip, just want to unmute yourself there. Um, former gunner, uh, 
Brilliant uh -huh. talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, just a quick question, which links back to something else. I once was shown a maquette by the widow of a senior gunner, mm -hmm. and it depicted a 13 pounder and limber and a pair of draft horses with a gunner driver, um, horses rearing up, very dramatic, heroic, and very similar to lots of the silver that you see in a, in a regiment of mess. And I was told that it was one of the options proposed for the memorial. And uh, knowing the sort of gunner hierarchy, it apparently was proposed very much by the RHA lobby, yes. <laughs> opposed to the yeah. uh, garrison artillery. Mm. Um, is there any truth in that? That, that, yes, that rings a bell. Um, it's a long time since I went, you know, I'm just trying to dig back in my memory for the early stages of the War Memorial Committee deliberations. But they do, they, they receive a lot of entries um, and, you know, there have been a lot of support during the war. You might have seen Lucy Kemp Welch as a, as she takes herself off to Salisbury Plain to look at the training and, and, and she paint you know a canvas with the guns it's all royal tournament stuff you know the 13 pounders are flying up in the air and that the horses are racing and, and and the regiment loved it so um yeah so they were they received a lot of models um and yes that that definitely rings a bell but i think it shows how the um you know how shall we say brutally realistic the the committee was that 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 didn't encapsulate the general experience of artillery only in at the very very beginning and the very very end was it really like that on any grand scale yeah i think it was a very happy choice yes absolutely thank you oh, apologies to everybody we've just simply run out of time i i, I don't like going beyond half past nine on, on these events um for my sanity and the speakers so <laughs> I'm, feel I'm, free to email me what well, i will say you know the email is m.l.connolly at ken.ac.uk very happy to answer if i can you know and, and and hear any of your thoughts ideas any of your stories about it really pleased to, to hear from anybody well that's a very kind offer Th thanks mark um I i'm going to uh, call it a, a night now um but once again if everybody would like to press the button for raising the hands as a virtual sign of, uh, of applause and I can confirm once again Mark that we've got hundreds of hands going up as a resounding a resounding a sound round of applause for something I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it's certainly opened my eyes um, about an aspect of the First World War which uh, I've not previously uh, paid sufficient attention to and I will uh, go away now uh, with the uh, feeling suitably educated so thanks very much indeed pleasure. for that mark thank you um, so much for invite real pleasure not at all it's a pleasure always having you mark uh, next uh, event this coming monday uh, please make sure you register nice and early if you can't make it please do cancel the registration because these do get full and if uh, and, and we're in danger of, of, of some folk not necessarily being able to attend these events um if uh, because they are so full so if you for whatever reason you, you can't attend just please cancel your registration but on that note uh, mark sincere thanks thank and you. to everybody else uh, good night and as ever stay safe good night yeah, thank you good night Mademoiselle from Armitage Park.